how is it, how's everybody doing? I'm just excited to be back on campus. Actually see people. I mean, we see each other a lot mm -hmm. on Zoom and Teams, but we don't actually see each see, other. right? Face to face. Actually yeah. face to face. Pre-mandates being lifted, you were so used to it only being a certain amount of people in the, at the grocery store, and it was so crowded, and I was just like, this is crazy. And it's like, I had to get back to being normalized in a full community of people. Right. So I was like, I'm just ready to go home. But it was nice because I enjoy people watching. So being able to just see people and then seeing how old people I've seen have changed. It's like, oh my goodness, like, you're still here, you're still well. And it, it was pretty nice being able to get out and then the weather being nice. It's beautiful. It gives us an opportunity to get out there. Yeah, that's what we've been trying to make sure at least carve out time on Sunday morning to go hike somewhere. Oh, get out of the house, get away from the cat and the dog, go out and just hike around. And it's nice because then you can clear your head and you don't have your phone going bing, 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 and get a Teams invite, and it's just like, okay, not listening to anything anymore. Right. Gonna go hike around. Well, now that we're back and, and we've gotten a chance to touch base a little bit, one of the things that I'm really interested in is after such a trying year, what have we all done for self-care? Earlier last year, I wasn't really good at it. I was still kind of, shift, kind of shifting from being in school and um, being involved in a lot of activities to being like, oh, well, I don't have to do anything today. And that I, got a, I kind of got into like a lazy state of mind real quick. And then I was very constant and like, oh, I don't have to get up and get dressed. And all of that was fine because um, I wasn't so used to it. I was just like, what am I supposed to do with myself? And then unfortunately, late last year, um, I was hit with losing a friend and then losing mm -hmm. a dog a week later. And so very quickly, within a matter of a couple of weeks, depression hit. And um, so, so far since then, I've been attending counseling sessions. Um, I speak a lot more to my mom. Um, and I have a twin sister, and she hasn't been in town because she's in Reno at UNR. And so it's been different not being able to talk to her face to face like this because right. something like this was like daily for us. And then having to wait till her schedule was clear for me to talk to her on the phone was a little bit difficult. But the, the, the therapy sessions has helped a lot. I've gotten more in touch with my spirituality, so that has helped a lot. And then, of course, um, getting back into drinking more water, um, getting my rest schedule um, back to where it needs to be. So Thank you for myself. being so open and talking about right. some of the challenges because there's so many people who are experiencing the exact same thing and they don't want to talk about it. And so with you being in a, a leadership position and talking about it and just being open about it, I, I really applaud you for doing that. Thank you. Exactly. I mean. If anything comes out of the pandemic that's good, I hope it's that the stigma related to mental illness just goes away. Because yeah. I think we're all gonna need counseling by the time this is over if we don't already. But I thought, well, great, this is an opportunity then to get it out in the open and talk about it and make sure people get that help. So yeah. I, I, again, thank you for saying that. Oh, thank you. We've all experienced the shared trauma. I think self-care is so important. Um, personally, I'm, I'm, it's harder for me to find ways to practice self-care just because as a young mom of a young, child it's hard to kind of carve out that free time you're constantly with your little toddler um, but I tell people I, I bought an espresso machine so I make my home <laughs> lattes so I don't have to go out and buy a latte and so that's kind of been my self-care having my coffee and um, the other major purchase I made during the pandemic I saved up and I bought myself uh, a new camera so that I could Ooh. like capture these moments nice. of my son growing up because I think it's really important to remember what your personal interests are, what your hobbies are in the middle of a pandemic or in the middle of motherhood, you know, staying true to who you are. And I love photography, I love writing. I'll carve out a little bit of time late at night after he goes to bed and do some personal writing, you know, writing poetry, writing short stories, um, something that's not related to work. And so um, that's kind of what I've been trying to practice and a little bit of time that I have. <laughs> well, when it comes to self-care, um, you know, I have, like you said, um, really gone back to the basics, spirituality, going back to nature, those types of things. And lately I've been uh, getting into lavender baths. So Ooh. that's like <laughs> <laughs> really kind of um, a fun thing to do, but whatever we need to do to, to feel better and to um, feel like we can be productive. And um, right. you know, it's just something that I really advocate. And, and as women, a lot of times, we forget that because we're taking care of everybody else. So during this time where we're kind of forced to be separate, what have you done to stay connected with the women and the people that inspire you and ground you? 
So um, I have a nonprofit called Vote Nevada, which is a civic engagement organization. And so everybody's like, oh, well, I guess we're not going to do anything because now we can't get together. And that's when I was like testing out Teams, testing out Zoom, that I will go crazy if I can't do something, you know, beside the normal mm -hmm. kind of grind of the day. And I am so glad that my friends, the people that I spent the most time with, jumped on board and are willing to get on that Zoom or that chat so we can keep doing things. We've been using a lot of technology. Um, I have a, a writing group, so we, we share each other's writings, we support each other, and all women, and we're all online. So we have a Facebook group that we created, and we use the Facebook rooms to video chat once a month so we can still have our regular writing group meetings even though we're not at a cafe. I think the techno because of the technology, it helps us stay in touch so much. Yeah. You know what, I honestly can say I have not, and I don't mean to seem impersonal, but because of what I was going through, I was mm -hmm. in a state of mind, like I didn't want to reach out to anyone because I was kind of, afraid of like how they would view me, especially the ones who I have been going to school with all this time, seeing my change in like, I, I was developing tics and all that stuff and I was just kind of like, oh, I'll just kind of stay away and try to get better. But now that I'm better, I'm more in tune with like, let's go out. Um, when my sister comes in town, let's go and do some things because we're 23, we're still young. And so a lot of people will say like, live a life like you're like a 23 year old is supposed to do, you know, don't just stay in the house. I'll be getting your phone number so that I can reach out to you. <laughs> Thank you. I was um, gonna say, <laughs> if, if you knew there was like, if I said to you, hey, you know what? However you are, uh -huh. Zoom me, I don't care. Just Thank talk. You. Uh -huh. would, yeah. you be, would, would you have done it if you would oh, know? Yes. Okay. I've, I've yeah. greatly, I've been appreciative because Mariana Kewen and Mary Kay Bailey, those two women I have reached out to a lot, and okay. they were in the know of when everything was going on. <laughs> Luckily, I've had them to talk to. Um, I have their numbers, so they will reach out and call and check on me. And um, I like that because a lot of people might think, oh, you're a student and faculty, like, why do you guys kind of, but it's like, they're exactly, that's exactly what's supposed to happen because sometimes right. people your own, your own age, being just a student, they might not be able to give you what you're needing in that moment. Right. And so Mariana and uh, Mary Kay have were able to give me everything, MVP Chrysantha. Friends also, I mean, I've, I've taken it upon myself sometimes to reach out to people that I know um, may feel isolated um, yeah. and, and things like that. It's important for us to, to, to reach out um, as well. And so as for me, um, I happen to be in two book clubs <laughs> and, um, and they, both of the book clubs have handled the pandemic very differently. And so that's given me an opportunity to engage in, in some fiction that I wouldn't have otherwise read, as well as talk to these really inspiring women about you know books that we've read. I actually started a hiking group. Nice. <laughs> it wasn't something I intended to do, <laughs> but um, actually we just um, found that the sisterhood that we have when either we're talking about books or we're communing with nature, walking around and hiking. Definitely, I think we're, we're social beings and so we definitely need to make sure that we reach out um, and, and make that connection. So it's really a, a good way to get out and clear your head and, and just kind of reset. It's a, yeah. it's a great opportunity to reset. Well, I guess we can turn the, the topic to uh, you know school and, and higher ed is really trending yes. um, towards more women. And so what role do you believe women have, um, should have in higher education? I think we need to be present. I think we need to be here because representation matters. I think when women, when women of any age see other women in higher education, they know that I can do that too. I can be there too. We have a place at the table. And I think especially, um, I like to talk a lot about um, women in STEM fields because it's so underrepresented. So many STEM fields are dominated by men. And it's such an interesting field that women can do and do so well. And I don't know if they're getting recognized enough for it. I agree, because I'm a STEM major, biology. Mm -hmm. I'm studying to become a dermatologist. Nice. And so once I figured out that I wanted to study biology, my whole mind was just shifting into STEM. Like, oh, who else is in these programs? Because you can learn from them. And when I get that white coat, I want to make sure I find you to let you know I stuck with it, no matter what you and anyone else had to say about it. The STEM program and education is not just for men. And we show that by the amount of uh, degrees women are getting nowadays. Some of them graduated and they're coming back to school. Right. And it's, it's pretty nice. Like my aunt has three degrees and you know, it's an influence. I think it's important not only for women to see us achieving, but 
for everybody, for men to see us in at every level. And as far as for faculty and staff, it's important for them to see, as well as students, for them to see women at the highest levels. It's always good to know that it can happen here at CSN. My Senate is the first Senate to have an all-women executive board. Mm. And so when I realized that, and I was the first African-American female president, I think, milestones were being made. I was like, oh my gosh. And then having, being told by the male students, like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you guys were the first all-female uh, executive board. Like, because most often you hear the stories, well, all women can't get together because all women are just moody and then all that stuff. That's why women can't be president. And you know, you hear these things and it makes you laugh because it's life. But then when you're able to go through the menstrual cycles and everything and still get your work done, it's like, now what? Like, say something else. And you have these experiences as a woman that men will never experience. I mean, you mentioned the menstrual, menstrual cycles, but also, like, I've been a woman breastfeeding my son while attending a meeting, while taking notes, while eating lunch at the same time. And man's not gonna know what that's like, <laughs> but we do it, we still get it done. One of the things that I have noticed, even being a part of the, which is why I was drawn to the Women's Alliance is, is that the conversations and the sisterhood that happens in the Women's Alliance, I recently led, as the chair elect, I recently led the bylaws um, committee and one of the things in there was a discussion on voting and majority and things like that and that was just like well that's so funny because we don't really vote we we talk it out <laughs> you know <laughs> and so I think women ha definitely have uh, a different style of leadership and it's not good or bad it's just different mm -hmm. and so it was one of those things where I talked about where I didn't necessarily uh, feel like I we would do ourselves a service by transitioning to this majority rules or anything like that. I wanted to change the bylaws to reflect and honor what the Women's Alliance had been doing all along, which was to talk to consensus. Because really, we do all get along in Women's Alliance, and we still are able to meet our goals and objectives. It makes you wonder, because again, I do a lot of stuff with politics and civics, and oftentimes you have rules because you need to control people. And sometimes you do need to control people. But then it doesn't create space where you, like you just said, where you talk to consensus. You just keep talking until everybody agrees and then you move on. And so it always makes me wonder, what would this country look like if everybody that wrote the Constitution had been women compared to men? Wow. Right? Yeah. I think the document <laughs> would look different. different. Yeah, it would definitely look different. And, but people will say, oh, it doesn't seem like you're very organized. I'm like, oh, yeah, we are. We all see the organization. It's just yeah. you don't see it. What are some moments that you found to be pivotal in your life that kind of make you who you are? I guess sometimes when I think about a question like that, it reminds me of hiking. Have you ever hiked up switchbacks where you've gone up a mountain and you have to stop every so often, eventually you get to the top? But it's those stops along the way that help you to get to the top. And so that's sometimes what I think about, but it's a struggle. It's, you know, that point where you said, whew, I made it this far, you know, didn't fall off the mountain. And so, you know, I look at like when I was faculty senate chair, that was a rough year because that was 10 years ago when the economy collapsed the first time mm -hmm. um, or the last time. And so I sometimes I think of struggle, but yet it was good because I made it through. I have moments from my professional career that kind of made me who I am and then moments from my, my personal life that make me who I am. And so professionally, um, I didn't know I was going to become a librarian when, you know, when I was younger. I went through so many job interests. I, I loved writing. I knew I loved writing. Um, I loved English. I lo you know, when I was four years old, I thought about being a doctor. You know, I had all these different paths. And then you get to college, and, and you're just not sure what to pursue. And um, I, un my undergraduate was in film because I knew I liked to write. I thought, well, maybe I could do screenwriting. And I actually enrolled in a master's in screenwriting program. I got accepted, but I just I didn't know how I could turn that into a career. I didn't want to leave my family and move to LA. And so, um, so I kept thinking, I kept you know, kind of soul searching. And in the meantime, I got a part-time job at a public library. And so at the public library, um, I learned from my colleagues that there's these online masters in library and information science programs that you can enroll in. You can get your degree and get a master's degree to become like, a full-fledged librarian. And I was working part-time, and I was working in the children's department. I loved working with the kids, but I also loved information, and I loved helping people. And I thought, you know, this is a really good place to be. And so if I hadn't gotten that part-time job in the public library, I wouldn't have thought of pursuing a master's degree in library science. And I was still kind of soul-searching. I actually applied for a master's degree in journalism because I was working part-time in a magazine as well. 
and then I applied for the master's degree in uh, library science. And ultimately, I couldn't juggle both, but I decided, you know, the library is where I wanted to be. And so I ended up pursuing that degree, and then that led me to eventually get hired at CSN as an academic librarian. And it's been one of the best decisions that I've made because I've enjoyed working here and I've enjoyed being a librarian. And I think so professionally, that moment of working in the public library led me to where I am now. And then, of course, in my personal life, I really think, you know, becoming a mom has made my identity as a mom. Like, I feel like this is something that I've always wanted to be. I've always wanted to have children. I've always loved children. And so I think there's, there's always those two sides or those multiple sides of your identity. And so that was very pivotal for me because now, now I have my son and just he brings such joy to my life, especially during this pandemic. Yeah. It's interesting how you talk about um, some of your experiences led you to well, maybe I'll, I'll go get a master's in this or, or in that. And so um, it's really interesting how some of the experiences we have can really shape who we become. I had a lot of things growing up because you like being active in a lot of things. So I thought like arts and I thought journalism and all these other things. But what stuck with me the most was the way people were treated because of their skin. Um, you'd hear people who get made fun of because of something they couldn't help or maybe they didn't have health insurance. And you know, you, they would sit and talk about it and cry about it and say like, oh, well, my mom talked about me. And in that moment, it made me realize, well, I don't like the way you, you're feeling about someone talking about you because of your skin. And so I started watching um, things about dermatology. And the one thing that really stuck and made me think like, oh, I'm gonna do dermatology is Chris Rock had a documentary called Good Hair. Mm -hmm. And in there, it mentioned um, a woman who actually worked with Oprah, was Oprah's esthetician or dermatologist. My dad goes, well, that's you, Carly. <laughs> and so he kind of put that in my head very early on. And I was like, you know what? I think I do, I'm into dermatology. Like, of course, like skin is skin, so you have your bad moments. But I was like, I absolutely want to be able to help people, not only with their skin and the physical, but being able to talk to them and say, hey, you know, you don't have to take it, know your worth. And knowing that when I'm in that position, I can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with my clients mm -hmm. or patients rather and um, being able to help them in that way. But I was like, definitely, because uh, we live in a society, unfortunately, where um, physical appearance is everything. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, if I'm able to help them in their physical appearance and then actually build on a relationship with them emotionally, then they pretty much are pretty much, are, they can be set with their, you know, their, the way they carry themselves. And so even now, um, people will talk to me like, oh, you wanna be a dermatologist? Keep my number. And there was even some time where I worked with uh, an old friend of mine and she has her own skincare business and so she taught me how to make some products and I was able to help some students by buying the products for them and giving it to them. So those are pivotal moments, not anything personally that I did, but just sitting back and listening to how someone else felt about themselves. And um, I feel like if more people had were like that, more empathetic, um, things would be a lot different. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's ways, of course you want to make sure that your own future is set and you do things that you love. But when you're able to help somebody else, it just makes you love it even even more. So you're thinking dermatologist slash counselor. Yeah, <laughs> I, especially now with my health therapy session, I'm like, you know what? You're making me feel so good and making me realize things about myself. So why not? Especially because at one point before I decided to become, um, before I made the switch to being biology, my thought was, I'm going to be a counselor. I'm going to be a counselor. My mom was like, you don't make any money in that. And I was like, I think you do, especially now. Like, I, they make money. I'm sure of it. But um even if I wasn't getting paid to do that, we're all counselors to somebody anyway. Right. And so just adding that on to you know, my resume of professional talker, um, mm -hmm. you know, it helps. It helps, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to go back and explore something that Sandra said, which was switchbacks. <laughs> Is life tends to be filled with, with those. Mm -hmm. And I can definitely um, attest to that in terms of, of my career at times it has been hot and cold and um, you know you take a step and then you take a step back or, or something like that and so I think it's really important for us to remember just how resilient we are mm -hmm. and if you just keep waking up every day and um, and setting your goals and working towards those goals that um, you know the switchbacks will maybe get you know less severe mm -hmm and maybe they'll um, continue to, to move you forward. So um, it's definitely something I see in my life and I think a lot of people see it in, in theirs as well. So 
I wouldn't necessarily say that I have a pivotal moment in, in my life. I will say that there's probably things that have contributed definitely to, to, to who I am. Um, that would probably be, you know, several things. Um, for example, um, my mother passed when I was 13 years old. And so I, and I was raised um, after that, obviously by my father. And so I think I, a, a lot of who I am today and the things that I think um, actually have more of maybe, it might sound weird, but maybe more of a male perspective, mm -hmm. um, just because in some of my formative years, my father was my, my main parent. And so, um, you know, but then I also think of just the resilience I had to put myself through, um, through undergrad. And I feel like I was a first generation student because my father wasn't in a position, even though he had had a degree, um, or degrees maybe at that at that point where um, where I felt like I was kind of having to figure it out on my own um, which is different for my children because I definitely feel like um, as they're going through college I am definitely giving them lots and lots of uh, support and feedback and maybe sometimes they don't want it <laughs> but that's what the mom does right, right. Um, and then, of course, becoming a mother has been really pivotal and really has shaped a lot of what I am willing to do and not willing to do in my career. You know, I remember many years ago being in awe of a, a particular executive and saying, I want to be just like her. And then as I was reading through the article, it talked about how um, one particular year she spent more money in childcare than she made yeah. that year and that that was an investment in her, her career. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a good point for her. But I knew at that point, I was like, that is not what, what I want to do. I mean, I'm not into quality time with, the, with my children. I want it both. I want it quality and quantity time uh, with them. So I think those were some, that was a pivotal moment for me to where I was ready to idolize this person and then when I, I got more information I was like no that's not what I want to do that's not how I want to to parent and and again I don't I you know I think the beautiful thing about being a woman is you don't have to do it one way or another I think that was good for that individual but I decided it wasn't good for me when students sometimes I just had students walk up to me and say how did you do what you did meaning how did you become a professor but I think sometimes when female students come and talk to me, they assume I'm going to say, all right, you have to be driven, you have to have a plan, yeah. you have to know. I'm like, no. If an opportunity comes up, jump and do it. Be ready to just throw everything to the side and go the other direction. Because if you don't, you're going to end up in a career. And that woman that you were idolizing, she might be miserable, but she just said, I got to stay on this path because I said I was going on this path. Mm -hmm. If an opportunity comes up and you can take it, jump. And if you need help, call me. Because then you end up in a job, like Stephanie said, that she really likes, even though that wasn't what she planned. She kind of meandered around and ended up there, and that's kind of what I did, too. And so when you're reading about women and they're saying, no, I had a plan, I knew what I was doing, and I had every, they're probably miserable. <laughs> Just do what you want to do. We'll be there for you. I'm loving that, they say progressive generation, but this is a generation that I'm coming up in where we're not having to be held to the same standards that my grandmother was. Mm -hmm. And so... Not, Thank goodness. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. not being, a, not having to be said, well, when are you having kids? And you being able to say, well, I had this job, didn't like it, and I'm going to quit it. And not anyone having, having the right, the authority, really, to look at you and be like, oh, she just quits. But because you're, you're finding yourself, even in your job, especially if it's a job, if it's a career, you can still make the change. But mm -hmm. um, so I like being able to come in a generation, grow up in a generation like that, and then knowing that. It's not a man's world, and I'm not saying that, you know, what people say woman, female is future, but just knowing that we're all starting to realize, like, we all have attributes and qualities that we can contribute to society, and it being a thing of equality and equity, and I'm like, I love it, because the whole, someone mentioned civil, civil um, engagement, and I was like, yes, I love being able to hear these type of conversations, because we all need support and we all can do something to help one another and so just knowing that you can be empowering women in that but also knowing that you can support the next one and the next one you know we're here sharing our experiences and 
and we're, we're, a lot of us are in positions to teach, but I think we're also constantly learning. And I think that that's what's fantastic about this generation and about what's happening right now is that we, we can learn um, from each other and we can learn um, more about diverse identities. So learning more about what women bring to the table, learning more about people of all identities. And um, I just recently joined our, our library's um, EDI committee. So it's uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think the more we have the opportunity to talk about this, the more we can normalize these identities and make sure that these voices are brought to the table and that we're not just talking and sharing, but we're also listening and learning. And I think mm -hmm. this is a great type of forum for that and, and being able to just constantly be open to, to learning about women, to learning about all these diverse identities. And so that makes me feel really happy that, that I can participate in that, that I can continue to learn and grow. And I'm, I'm so eager to learn from, from all of you as well. Do you have the last words of wisdom? Last words of wisdom? I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll definitely say it's been a, a pleasure um, getting a chance to to talk with you ladies and um, and to spread some positivity mm -hmm. um, and and how exciting it is to be able to do that in Women's History Month. Um, I like to call it Women's Empowerment Month, <laughs> um, and especially Women's Herstory Month, um, where we get to share some of the wonderful things that women have accomplished and um, just the tenacity of, of women and how we can have different roles and um, in support society. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.